Ahoy mateys and welcome back to Trick Bricks. I'm Jamie and today we're going to continue our 30th Anniversary Pirates retrospective series by taking a look at set number 6274, Caribbean Clipper. Released in 1989, it contains 378 pieces, 4 minifigures, and retailed for $54 in the US. In some parts of the world, you may know this ship by another name, the Seahawk. This was the second of two large sailing ships released in the initial wave of pirates, and she's certainly a beauty. Unfortunately, I don't have the instructions for this one, so we're just going to jump right in, beginning at the top and working our way down. Capping off the clipper's tallest mast is a small imperial flag, and there's a larger flag just behind it. And yes, this is the correct orientation for them. Many times you'll see builders point them like this, which seems to look correct, but if the wind were blowing in this direction, the ship would be going in reverse, right? And I know I may sound like a broken record, but take care when attaching these guys. I see more of them with broken clips than not, and it's easy to avoid. Instead of clipping them to the bar piece, just slide them on. This puts little to no stress on the clips, and could save you a lot of heartache. Once again, like the Barracuda, you've got a single long string running from bow to stern that adds a bit of overall shaping to the ship's profile. And it's got help maintaining that shape by these two adjustable booms on both masts. The blue and white cloth sails are the same size and shape as the Barracudas, although here we only get three instead of five, and they're all positioned toward the bow, which kind of gives the whole ship a nice forward ever, backward never stance. They hang from the mast on the same upside down plate built yards used on most LEGO sailing ships, and the jib sail is held in place by the string. Once again, I've opted not to lace the string through this bottom corner hole, since it tends to pull the sail down, and I'm always worried about accidentally tearing out the holes. Being three decades old, all of these sails demand a bit of care and attentiveness when being handled, because nowadays, they're pretty expensive to replace. An interesting design choice was made with this rigging element, being positioned perpendicular to the ship instead of having one clip to each side of the mast. I kind of like this look though, and these are always a great place to position your minifigs. And moving forward, just under the bowsprit, is the figurehead, which is formed by a fairly rare element, the yellow parrot. I mentioned this in episode 7 of my Adventurers retrospective series, but this bird was only ever released in two sets, the Caribbean Clipper, and one of the hardest to find adventurer sets, Valley of the Kings. So if you've got a yellow parrot, there's only a few places it could have come from. And perhaps this is a fun clue as to how the ship got its alternate name of the Seahawk. The yellow continues around here, and I think this color choice goes nicely with the blue and white sails. Then we have the anchor dangling out of this porthole in the bow section. Of course, it can be raised and lowered thanks to the winch inside. I should mention that if your clipper is mainly a display piece and you want the anchor to be seen all the time, you're going to want to decide beforehand which side of the ship you want it on, because once it's in place, the only way to move this from side to side is to untie the string, which can get annoying. The bulk of the clipper's hull is comprised of just three large elements, a full two sections shorter than the Barracuda. So it seems like this ship would have been built more for speed and maneuverability rather than an all-out gunship. And speaking of guns, you can see them peering out through these ports on the side. In this case, the blue flag pieces covering the gun ports actually open downward instead of up, which I like quite a bit. It keeps our sailor's line of sight clear at the rail, and it also adds a nice visual break in the brown hull. We'll get back to the cannons in a moment, but let's keep moving toward the stern. You've got an unlit lantern on each side right here, and some more blue and yellow coloring as we round the back corner. I have to say, the Clipper's color scheme is one of my favorite things about it, and being manufactured in a time when LEGO had just a fraction of the color palette that they have today, I think the designers did a fantastic job. It's very simple, yet somehow elegant at the same time. A pair of latticed windows adorn the stern, and below them we'll find a small platform with a hook for towing smaller boats. But there aren't any included in this set, so you'll need to add one from your own collection. 
Beneath that is the all-important rudder, which is able to swing from side to side. The starboard side is identical to the one we've just seen, so let's go ahead and take a look topside. Up here we'll find some nice yellow railing along each side, a short wall at the rear so our sailors don't fall off, and of course the ship's wheel. It isn't connected to the rudder in any way, so it just spins freely. Other than two small lanterns here, that's about all there is to see up on the poop deck. There is a bit more down below though, but I'm not exactly sure how we're supposed to actually get down there, since it seems like LEGO forgot to include any sort of stairs or a ladder. Let me see what I can do about that. There, much better. I know they were trying to keep the peace count down and all, but I think they could have splurged just a little and saved our sailors a lot of broken legs. And while we're on the subject of not splurging, let's hope the captain doesn't value privacy because he's not going to get any here. Normally this section would be walled off and have a door, but here it's all open and features zero frills. Luckily we do get a treasure chest though. And it also doubles as a desk, with a printed map tile and yellow goblet placed on top. Inside are eight of Captain Redbeard's favorite things. Of all the ways you could customize and improve on the original design, I think this is the area that would benefit the most from it. So let's leave it behind and check out the cannon area. The clipper gets two pieces of heavy artillery, and you can easily position them on whichever side you choose, thanks to the smooth tiles they both sit on. If you have a few extras, you can even increase the clipper's cannon ranks to four. In the center, we'll find two baskets full of ammunition to lob at the pirates. If we keep moving forward, we'll see the anchor which I pointed out a minute ago, as well as a variety of weapons clipped around it to fully arm your minifigs. And just ahead of the mast is probably my favorite part of the ship's interior, a very small cargo hold for storing more weapons, accessories, or perhaps some treasure reclaimed from those scurvy pirates. And speaking of pirates, there's none to be found here, so these guys must be doing their jobs pretty well. First up, we get the three Imperial Sailors. They're all identical to one another, and they're nearly identical to the standard Imperial Soldier, with the exception of the tricorn hat and the lack of a backpack. Each one gets a weapon to defend the ship with. And moving up several ranks, we have this fine gentleman. Nope, according to Brickopedia, this isn't the Clipper's captain, but instead the one and only Governor Broadside, leader of the Imperial forces in the Caribbean. And technically, he's exclusive to this set, although the only thing differentiating him from his other appearance in this series, in 6276 Eldorado Fortress, a set which we'll be getting to soon, I promise, is the fact that here the feather in his hat is yellow instead of red. Nevertheless, he's a fantastic figure. Featuring a much more regal torso print with lots of gold trim, a pair of yellow epaulets, and a unique face print only used for his character. He must be too busy hunting down pirates to shave because he's got a full 5 o'clock shadow, a bushy mustache, and sideburns. The thing I appreciate the most about him though is this bicorn hat. It's actually molded in white and sports black printing on both sides that give it the illusion of having ruffles along its crown, and there's also a small white rosette at the bottom corner. As previously mentioned, it's topped off with a yellow plume. And he's certainly not defenseless, brandishing both a flintlock pistol and a cutlass. Rumor has it that yellow wine glass we saw on the ship a moment ago also belongs to him, but we'll have to wait till we get to El Dorado Fortress to see if that's something we need to address. The Governor is a fine addition to any minifigure collection, and he's also fairly rare and slightly valuable in his own right, usually going for between $15 and $30 depending upon his condition. But that's all for our crew of fearless bluecoats. We'll let them get back to pirate hunting, and I'm going to get to my final thoughts. All told, the Clipper is definitely a step down from the Black Seas Barracuda, but I think that was somewhat intentional. LEGO undoubtedly knew that there were going to be a lot of kids that wanted a pirate ship, but not nearly enough parents who could afford $110 in 1989 money. So they stripped away many of the fancy design elements and accessories in order to bring the piece count, and subsequently the price, down to a more manageable level. 
And I'm sure there were more than a handful of kids who chucked the Imperial flags and raised the old Jolly Roger above the clipper. That said, I think they could have thrown in just a few more pieces and really improved upon the initial design, especially when it comes to the interior. But that also brings me to another point. This is an excellent candidate for customization, adding bits and pieces from your own collection and filling in the gaps necessitated by LEGO's self-imposed parts budget. I've seen quite a few amazing modifications over the years that turn this bare-bones military vessel into a truly majestic queen of the sea. It's definitely worth a Google image search if you've got a few minutes to spare. And if you'd like to add the Caribbean Clipper to your collection, you're going to need something more than minutes to spare. A used set in decent condition is going to run you right around $150, which seems high for what you get as far as piece count goes, but keep in mind that sailing ships in general are highly sought after by collectors, and to this day the Clipper remains the only blue coat ship ever released by LEGO, so all of that plays into its value on the second hand market. And if you thought $150 was expensive, try buying a sealed copy. They can jump well into the four figure range. At the end of the day, despite the relatively high price and a handful of shortcomings, I still absolutely love this ship. I don't regret buying it for a minute, and if you should choose to do so yourself, I don't think you'll regret it either. But that's all I've got for you today. If you enjoyed this review, feel free to leave a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be back soon with the next episode in the 30th Anniversary Pirates Retrospective series, but until then, this has been Jamie for Trick Bricks. As always, thanks for watching, take care, and play well!